We're beginning to talk about sort of the biochemistry of the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And we're also going to be talking ultimately about how those two gases regulate how quickly and how deeply you are breathing. So we left off here. We were talking about the fact that oxygen is not very soluble in water. And that means that the oxygen is attached to a protein called hemoglobin hidden inside of these red blood cells. And it is very difficult for a chemoreceptor cell who has their little chemoreceptor sort of tongues out here in the blood, very difficult for that cell to measure the amount of oxygen in every drop of blood quickly and accurately. However, it is very easy for that chemoreceptor cell to measure the amount of carbon dioxide and indirectly the amount of carbon dioxide by measuring the acidity of your plasma. It's very easy for your cells to do that because carbon dioxide is very soluble in water and so it's primarily transported in solution and it is found abundantly in the plasma of your blood. 90% of it is in the form of bicarbonate. I want to make this point, it is not attached um, significantly to hemoglobin. That's, that's not why hemoglobin uh, evolved, okay? Hemoglobin evolved to transport oxygen. Carbon dioxide transport is bicarbonate. Just doesn't need any help, okay? It's very soluble in water. Only a little bit of hemoglobin. There's a little bit that's dissolved gas, but very, very little. Before we uh, head off to the concept of how your body knows how quickly you need to breathe, let me uh, come back to this concept that oxygen is going to diffuse into your blood at the alveolar capillaries, and it will diffuse out of your blood at the systemic capillaries. And that's not because oxygen knows where it is. None of these things know where they are. It is because the concentration gradient at the level of the alveolar capillaries is from the air you just inhaled into the blood and the concentration gradient at the level of the tissue capillaries for oxygen is from the blood into the tissues. I want to make one further point that carbon dioxide's concentration gradients are exactly the opposite. Oxygen gets used up by the cells of all of your tissues, tissues, your liver cells, your kidney cells, your muscle cells. That oxygen is getting used up and it's making carbon dioxide. So there's very little oxygen out here, lots of CO2. So at the level of the tissue, CO2 jumps into the blood and at the level of the alveolus, CO2 jumps out. So CO2 and oxygen are constantly moving past each other. This is um, an interesting concept for physiologists and I think it's actually a really clever idea. Um, we are talking about hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. Uh, if you don't find this graph particularly illuminating, neither do I. So let me tell you in my own words about the affinity of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein. And even though it's not the world's most exciting protein, it is still a protein. And proteins adjust what they're doing on the basis of their environment. Uh, hemoglobin is particularly sensitive to the acidity of the environment, the pH, and to the temperature environment. This graph is about the pH of the environment. What is affinity? Affinity is the word that is used to describe how hard a molecule like hemoglobin is hanging on to something, in this case, oxygen. So if I say that at a certain point, hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen, I would say that at that moment, hemoglobin is being really greedy about the oxygen. Mine, 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 taking it all, taking it all, taking it all. If I say that hemoglobin has a low affinity for oxygen at a certain point, that means the hemoglobin is suddenly very generous with the oxygen. Here, have one. Here, take one. Oh, I have plenty. All right. Now, wouldn't it be useful if this molecule hemoglobin was really greedy, loading itself up with oxygen in the alveolar capillaries, 
And then when it got down to the tissue capillaries, that same molecule became very generous. Wouldn't that be useful? Yeah, uh, life has evolved this protein so it acts exactly that way. When there is a lot of oxygen in an environment, then the hemoglobin is really greedy for the oxygen. When there is not much oxygen in the environment, hemoglobin totally changes its personality and becomes very generous. When the environment is very acidic, hemoglobin becomes generous. When the temperature is higher, hemoglobin becomes generous. Now, what's the right way to say that? The right way to say that is hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen goes down when the pH is acidic, okay? So that's difficult to remember, isn't it? Probably my explanation already didn't make sense. Listen to it a couple of times. But let's think about how this would actually work. And in order to think about how this actually works, I like to think about skeletal muscle. When skeletal muscle is working super hard, it needs a lot of oxygen. When skeletal work muscle is working really hard, wouldn't it be useful if as the red blood cells carrying their hemoglobin go through this hard working skeletal muscle, wouldn't it be useful if hemoglobin just got very, very generous and started handing out oxygens? In other words, when skeletal muscle is working really hard, wouldn't it be useful if hemoglobin had a low affinity for oxygen as it goes through that hard working skeletal muscle? It would and it does, right? Now, what is going on in hard working skeletal muscle? When skeletal muscle is working hard, it generates a higher temperature, right? You start to sweat when you're working out really hard. And what else would happen in skeletal muscle? You might get lactic acid buildup, right? And what would happen to oxygen levels? They would drop because what? The skeletal muscle is using it. Those three things, a lower pH, more acidic pH, a higher temperature, and lowered oxygen levels, all three are the things that will cause hemoglobin to have a lower affinity for oxygen, meaning it wants to give it away. And the opposite of those things, a higher pH, a cooler temperature, and uh, higher oxygen concentration levels, those are all things that make hemoglobin greedy, have a higher affinity for oxygen, and those are the three situations we find in healthy lungs. Clever, right? Let's talk a little bit more about blood chemistry, this biochemistry. Uh, I know that back when we were still meeting in person, uh, I wrote this on the board more than once. So here we've got carbon dioxide and we're gonna dissolve it in water. When it dissolves in water, it actually creates a new molecule called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is H2CO3. So that is a molecule with two hydrogen atoms, one carbon atom, three oxygen atoms. And in a water environment, carbonic acid, since it's an acid, it has a tendency to pop apart to donate a hydrogen ion. And so it would do this, it would turn into a hydrogen ion plus this molecule and this molecule, oops, I'm sorry, the little, um, the little, this guy got lost, plus bicarbonate, there we go, right? Bicarbonate is how most uh, CO2 is found in your uh, blood. So from this particular formula, I want you to remember that when a patient's carbon dioxide levels are higher, then their patient's hydrogen ion levels would be higher. So their pH would be lower, their pH would be more acidic, right? Now, all of this that is discussed here, hydrogen ions, CO2 levels, all of that is dissolved in the plasma part of your blood. So all of that hydrogen ion, CO2 levels is very available for chemoreceptor cells to be able to taste and measure. And it is for this reason that the rate and depth of breathing is adjusted to maintain the levels of pH and partial pressures of CO2. And I should point out that when it comes to, um, when it comes to your 
um, rate of breathing and depth of breathing, the amount of oxygen in your blood is not an important factor, right? So on your study guide, how does oxygen level affect the rate of breathing? It almost doesn't. Okay, a little bit, a tiny little bit. But at any given moment of any given day, the reason that you're breathing faster or more deeply when you exercise has nothing to do with oxygen. If I were to measure your pulse oximetry, it's 100%. It has everything to do with levels of carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, and hydrogen ions, right? Let's look at their effects on respiration. Your body has two different groups of chemoreceptor cells that specifically are telling your brain something about um, when it's time for you to take the next breath. And they are known as the peripheral chemoreceptors and the central chemoreceptors. In 150, you should have learned that the central chemoreceptors are called central because they're actually in the central nervous system. They're actually right here uh, on and near the medulla oblongata, right? So the central chemoreceptors, they are right in the central nervous system. What are the central nervous, central chemoreceptors? What are they tasting? What are they measuring? They are tasting or measuring the, um, sorry, they're tasting or measuring the cerebrospinal fluid, okay? The most powerful effect on your rate of breathing is going to be the pH of your cerebrospinal fluid. And that is because the central chemoreceptors, they speak directly to the medulla oblongata. And, way they, and when they say, hey, your cerebrospinal fluid is very acidic, then the medulla is going to go, oh, I better breathe faster, right? Where are the peripheral chemoreceptors? You should remember from 150 that they are found here at the aortic bodies that's drawn in different regions on the aorta, depending on the textbook, but they're right here at the aortic arch and also here up at the internal carotid arteries, right? So the peripheral chemoreceptors, they are busy uh, tasting the plasma of the blood. Now, they both of these sets of chemoreceptors are measuring pH. The peripheral chemoreceptors are also measuring the amount of CO2 or bicarbonate in the blood. Now, now how is this working? Okay, let's go, let's go back a slide. Sorry. Let's go back a slide. Um, no. I am going to, I'm going to put in an empty slide so that I can try to draw this for you. All right. Yeah, me drawing, never a great idea, is it? Okay, so here we go. We're going to draw something. We're gonna draw a graph. Yeah, I know that's terrible, okay? And over here, this is going to be oxygen levels, the level of oxygen in your blood. The level of oxygen in your blood, as you hold your breath, it goes down, 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 down. That is true, but that is very difficult for your um, chemoreceptors to measure, okay? So that's not what your chemoreceptors are measuring. Your chemoreceptors are measuring two things. They are measuring the pH. I'm gonna draw the pH in yellow. pH, all right? And as you hold your breath, the pH of your blood is getting more acidic. All right? So your peripheral and central chemoreceptors, they're not measuring oxygen directly. It's too hard to do. Oxygen's hidden inside the red blood cells. However, they are measuring pH. And your body knows that in general, on any average day, as your oxygen levels are dropping, your pH levels are dropping as well. Why? Because CO2 levels are going up. So I am going to draw CO2 levels in green, okay? So here we've got CO2 levels in green. As you're holding your breath in any given day, CO2 levels are going up, right? And I told you just a slide ago that as CO2 levels go up, 
They release more hydrogen ions, more hydrogen ions means pH levels go down. So it, in evolutionary time, uh, the physiology of humans was adapted for this concept. This concept is that it is hard to measure oxygen, easy to measure pH and CO2. And on any given average moment in the day, as oxygen levels decline, CO2 levels go up and pH levels go down. So your body says, heck, that red stuff, too hard to measure, no worries, easy for me to measure yellow and green. So your rate and depth of respiration is completely measured by um, how high your CO2 levels are and how low your pH levels are. We're going to start here at the beginning of our next video.